Welcome back, everybody, to Vintage and Stuff podcast, where every week we talk about vintage and stuff. You guys are here, so obviously you like it. This week we have Eric Schrader of Junkyard Jeans. Eric has a long, colorful career in the vintage business. He is the main character in an amazing documentary called Blue Gold that documents the whole progression of denim from its inception to where it is today and follows Eric around on his adventures in vintage. It's very cool. You got to check it out. We talk about that. We talk about his career. He's from Boise, Idaho. We talk about how he got in the business. We talk about uh, getting into the Japanese market and the auction he's been running there for many, many years. Uh, lots of good stuff. He's a super OG, been selling at the Rose Bowl for, geez, I'm going to say 25 years-ish. So a long, long time. <clears throat> but I wanted to give a shout out to a very special person in my life. Someone who's very dear to me. Someone who's very near to me. His name is Matt. <laughs> Matt, I love you. Go follow Most Recent Vintage. Uh, he was he edits this podcast, guys. He does it for the love. And because he gets paid. But he also does it for the love. <laughs> and he creates a lot of uh, amazing... He did the documentary of Durango... And he's just a great guy. Most recent vintage. Go follow him. Thank you for always being you, dude, and uh, crushing it and producing this podcast. That's it. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Wait, 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 wait. First, before we get into this, please like this. If you're watching on YouTube, click that bell so you get notified when new podcasts drop. It helps me out a lot. Share this with your friends. Okay, okay, enough. Here we go. Thank you for coming on the show, dude. Just for everyone listening, we recorded for half an hour already and we're re-recording <laughs> because I fucked up, but here we go again. Thank you for coming on, Eric. No worries. Just because I've been up all night, you know, and we waited yeah. a half an hour. No big deal. <laughs> no, no big deal. All good. Just for, co just for context, Eric had a snow dilemma this morning that caved in a shed roof or something. So he's been, he's been running on it. Wow. Okay, so you have uh, such an interesting career. You've done so many cool things throughout your life, including the Blue Gold documentary. But that's just that was just kind of an expose of, of, of who you are and what you've done. You've been selling denim as long as anybody I know. We've known you, me, myself, my brother, since our intro to the business. And actually, you were kind of instrumental in that because you were – kind of teaching us a lot about the business actually in the early days so actually thank you for that i didn't tell you that on the first round <laughs> you know you bet like to me like i was taught by other people and as long as people are selling to me and like and they're taking care of me i'm gonna take care of them like that's it. what you know and who you have a relationship in this business is the greatest value of all and that's being able to buy and sell wherever you go in this business is you know, always makes it better. Yeah, that's a good attitude. You know, there's a, this business can be cutthroat and there, yeah, a lot of people, there can be, you know, there's different attitudes about the business, but, you know, you've always been super, super straight up with us and I can call you sometimes and, and ask for advice on something, which I, I really do actually appreciate. So thanks for that, man. No, nah, and I appreciate good deals. So yeah, <laughs> it works both ways. <laughs> okay 
we got to jump back to your intro story of how you got in this crazy world of denim. So kick it off here. Where, uh, how, how I was, got in this crazy world of denim. To, you know, you had my roommate. Before, in, yeah, go for it. Yeah, my roommate in college. Um, I, I lived in a house like with eight guys right by the college. And um, I think there's probably 10 guys that usually live there even though there are only eight that paid rent, but um, one of them would borrow a couple grand every month, almost every month from me. And he'd give me 2,500 bucks back at the end of the month. And it was a really good deal. And after five or six months of it, I was like, I need to find out what he's doing to be able to pay, you know, borrow two and pay back five. And he was traveling all the time and he was buying brand new 501 shrink to fits at like JC Penney, Sears and the work workman's outfitter, all that stuff. And, he would buy them and take them to France and sell them for a bunch of money in France, spend the week in France on vacation and come back and have money to pay me back. And um, so I learned about the diversion business from him and I did jeans as well, like new 501s into Germany. And I did like new Nike, like when Nike release dates for Jordan and Air Max, I would go and buy all of those I could. And I even bought, tamagotchi toys like those little remember the tamagotchi yeah, totally. toy that you fed him and cleaned his pan and all that oh i was buying those and selling them back to japan <laughs> it was crazy those i remember when i was a kid that was when i was in elementary school those were kind of hot and everybody wanted one of those things oh yeah well they started off in japan and then when they came to the u.s they quit selling them in japan and everyone in japan still wanted them and there's these car dealers that contacted me and they asked if I could get, you know, Tamagotchi toys and they would give me 40 bucks a piece for all of them and $60 for silver ones. And so I would buy them for like 19.99 and ship them to Japan and make good money. Nice. But they would give them away as gifts for people to come in and test drive a car. Crazy. So I, you know, I, I want to know about the sneaker drops back then, because this is something very interesting to me. So many people in the vintage business now started potentially selling and flipping sneakers has been this whole transition into that. But back in those early days when you were going to buy Air Maxes and Jordans, what was the sneaker drops like? Were they lined up and how did you get yourself in there? Well, I got myself in there because I had money to buy them and at like Foot Locker and all those shoe places and malls, the, the salesman would get commission for selling shoes. So, um, they, they knew I would be there to buy everything from size eight to 11. And I kind of felt bad because outside there'd be like this long line of kids waiting to get their shoes. And, you know, they're buying them one at a time from two other staff guys, but I would go and I would buy everything in that size range. And then, so there'd be no shoes left for those kids that are all in the back of the line. Unless they wore like seven and a half or 11 and a half, then they could buy all the shoes they wanted. Yeah, totally. <laughs> if if you've ever been on a dig and you show up at like a, the basement of an old sneaker store and, and all there is is like, yeah, sevens and sixes or like twelves <laughs> and thirteens, fourteens, you're like, you're like, ah, oh, I've been beat. Somebody beat me. Exactly. That's funny. No, it was nuts. I, I would fly to Houston and rent a U-Haul truck, and then I'd just hit every mall and shoe store, driving all the way back to Boise. It took me about a week and a half, and it would be like eighty to $100,000 in sneakers. And we'd only make like 20%, but it was good. You know, it was good money. Yeah. That's a high cash, a high cash uh, intensive business buying that much and making 20 and buying, I mean, you still make a lot of money, but you're just playing with a lot of cash at that point. You know? Oh no, it was, I had an Amex way back then. And because I was doing 175 or a hundred thousand a month on my Amex, these guys would call me from New York. You know, like you see on the, in the movies wanting to give me all this, these stocks, like, well, I'm going to just give you this much money right now. You know? And uh, I'm like, really? no, I don't have that much. Oh yeah. They would like, I'm going to spot you 50 grand in this and this. And cause it, I made some list somewhere for, you know, for that they wanted uh, for people who spent high, that much. The high roller list. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Did you ever find out how your roommate 
got into the business? Like, how did he figure out how to go over there and flip pants? You know, I I know I don't know that. I know he had yeah. a girlfriend from France, so that might have been it. Just that he'd been back and forth quite a few times, and that people maybe asked him, you know, can you yeah, get his jeans? And back uh, then, everybody wanted jeans. Everybody wanted shrink to fit five ones. Yeah, and it, you know, it wasn't such a globalized world where like everyone would get around so much. It was harder to travel. It cost more. People stayed put. So bringing stuff around like i'm sure if, if your relative went on vacation to america they'd be you'd be like buying them shit to bring back you know if you're going to russia or something yeah that i mean it's hard to believe but for guys that like watch your bid stitch stuff but i did this business before there was the internet like yeah we we faxed orders and we talked long distance on a on the phone that was on your wall <laughs> Like that's yeah. how I learned this business I, orders. I get faxed orders and yeah, that was like the first five, six years I did this. People don't even understand what that's like in today, <laughs> in today, in today's youth don't understand what that's like. You know, I, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 20. So it was still my whole childhood. You'd be like, you know, like you, you tell your friends, we're going to meet up somewhere. You better fucking be there because you can't call them and be like, <laughs> where were you? You know what I mean? Oh, exactly. <laughs> You got to make sure that shit happens. You got, and you remembered phone numbers, you know. Oh yeah, you no. actually had them up here. When I was in college, I bet I knew three hundred phone numbers, and yeah. today I might know six. Yeah, totally. But I remember, all, I remember all my girlfriend's numbers in college and high school. That's the a crazy part. Have given us the ability to become dumber and not worry, not have to carry so much information. Google machine. Oh yeah, but now if you got two hundred bucks and an Instagram page, you're a vintage dealer. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Access to the bins, and that's all you need. You're good to go. And single stitch T-shirts. Yeah, and it's actually super funny because I was talking to the last guest I had on, which this the episode hasn't dropped yet, was uh, Welcome Home Aaron, who you know, I'm sure. Sure. Um, we talked about that when single stitch became a thing because like in the early days, no one ever talked about that or thought about that. It was not really like, it was obviously there because it's a physical thing, but it was never so worried about or discussed. And it wasn't until recently I I still that people came. Honestly, I still don't get it. Like, I don't know. I don't even know why that's a deal. Like they make single stitch t-shirts today. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's a... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And it was it, t- it took one of the Japanese guys eventually to tell me like, oh, this is this and that's that. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even think that you were looking for that. But um, interesting. So, OK, so off camera before we started, you told you had told me that you just were recording yesterday podcast. You're a very popular guys. So your second podcast in two days here uh, with one of your FITM students and FITM is a very renowned fashion school. Is it, It's in L.A. or where is it? Yeah, LA. There's an LA campus in Seattle and San Diego. Yeah. It's, and you it has, are. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it has the only accredited denim major in the US. Yes. Very cool. So you are on the, you said the denim board, board of directors, the, denim board of directors? Denim board. I don't know if it's the board of directors, but <laughs> when they enter. The, a magazine interviewed the people at FITM, and that's when they told them I was on the FITM board. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so cool. Which is just a crazy accolade, first of all, that you get to have so much knowledge about denim that you're teaching students about creating genes and the history of denim. Um, and that, 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 that denim is such a big thing that it has its own major. Is that what you said? It has a major, right? Yeah. Yeah, denim major. So yeah, give us a quick little uh, uh, little info about the program and what people do in the program. And well, it was fun. I, the first time I went to FITM, I didn't I didn't know what FITM was either. But uh, the lady that taught the denim course there, she contacted me after Blue Gold. And I guess when you watch a movie where Adriana Goldsmith is asking you questions about denim, then all of a sudden you're a denim expert. Because I mean, I never considered myself a denim expert, and um and when all that when blue gold dropped like all of a sudden i'm getting hit up by all these different people but she asked if i wouldn't come talk to the class it's like i went when i was down in la working and went and visited the kids and like i think i talked for an hour and a half 
it was, I was nervous and, um, she told me like, you know, take the hour, but I just kept talking (laughs) and sharing my experiences. And I felt so bad for the students, but, um, the other part was I was so excited because I'm like, my mom would be so excited that I'm teaching at a college, you know, but yeah, she would totally. never believe that. But after that, they asked me if I would help teach the course. And, um, every other week I would, would do an hour, an hour and a half, um, on a, whatever project they asked me to. Um, I even, I do like ethics and, um, buying, buying, selling, negotiating, all, you know, all kinds of stuff that we do. And, but when you have, when you've done that for 25 years, it's, it's just easy just to, you know, write a few notes and you can talk for 45 minutes. Yeah. It's, you know, they say 10,000 hours to become an expert and you've definitely put that in. You've definitely put that in yeah. with the denim. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually I do close to that in five years. 10,000 yeah. hours, but that's because so, I, I work just half, I work half a day, 14 hours or 12 hours. And yeah, so I hit you up yesterday to do the speaking about it. I hit you up yesterday to do this podcast and you're like, I'm like, is, uh, is 8 a.m. too early to record? Cause we're recording at like 8 a.m. But even though we fucked up, we've been here an hour already, <laughs> but you're like, you're like, no, no, I get to the office around 4 35. I'm like, who yeah. is this guy? What are we talking about here? I'm just like an old farmer. When I grew up in the country, in a small town, like the farmers were all up at four o'clock and getting coffee at the gas station and and they'd talk and then they'd go to work. And so I would would meet the farmer that I worked for at 4.30 and we'd go to work. And so, yeah, to me, working half a day is 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's funny. I have one employee – who works for me right now? Amin is her name. She's she's amazing. Uh, she's a pleasure to work with, and she grew up on a farm. And now I have this theory that, like, I, you know, I really want to know someone's history. I'm like, yeah, like save the farmers for me because I I want to hire them all. Like, they, the work ethic is amazing. They're 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 up for it. They're ready to go with projects. There's you know, it's like they they understand a real day's work. I've been an employer for 30 years, and if I see Seneca Foods and a Hickville town in Idaho, I'm hiring them because that's exactly true. They have a work ethic. They aren't they aren't afraid to work when the job's not done. Like some people you hire and you're working on a project and it gets time to their work's done, but you still got like you know 30 minutes or 40 minutes to finish. Oh, they're out. Oh, they're done. I'm, yeah. But girls off the, girls off the farm. Or guys off the farm that have grown up with that kind of ethic, like they'll stay two or three more hours. They know it has to get done. Yeah, that's just you know, and that's they, just the way I learned it. it. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I think that that's something to be said. There's a few other things I, I ask about, like if they've played team sports. I think is a big deal too because you want someone who can like work with people and understand like mm-hmm. coaching and and teammates and stuff. And um, yeah, you know, as you be live in the business world for long enough, you start to really pick up on certain things and that kind of shit is very important. Um, okay. I'm going to jump into a guest question here from spiders garage. He says, did Rob Schneider's mom have to pay off a denim debt that he owed to you? I don't know if she paid it off, but I had to call her to get paid. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you got to do. You got to get, you got to get to the, uh, the family, put a little fear in there. Yeah, no, like he he had, uh, Rob had an addiction to vintage Hawaiians and wore jeans. And, um, yeah, I was like, I couldn't afford, it was like 55 grand and maybe like eight or nine months that, that I was waiting for it. So it was hard, but not after his mom knew I got it right away. (laughs) Um, we kind of jumped. We kind of jumped around here, and I want to. We got to jump back now to where we ended off your intro story to the business, sort of at the. Uh, you call what do you call it when you were selling jeans overseas? You called it a diversion, diversion business. business. 
It's like gyp- being a gypsy. A lot of gypsies do. Yeah, the which is an interesting day. word. I've never heard that. It's probably which essentially old. is like today people <laughs> call that like our our um, what do people call that now? Like arbitrage or just buying and selling and reselling? I guess. Yeah, I call it a hustler. Is there a difference? To me, it's yes. just hustling. Motherfucking hustler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's a, and I've done. I've been a hustler since I was in kindergarten. That's, so I, uh, I also like. I learned how to hustle in school selling stuff, and then in my early teens, I trapped um, muskrat and beaver and coyotes, and I would sell the furs to the furriers, no and those guys were like, "Yeah, they were like crazy negotiators." They'd ask you what you had, and you'd tell them like, "Oh, those are no good right now." I'm like, "No, I know. Like muskrats are great right now." And then they'd measure them and each one and grade it, and I'm I like had to I had to go back and forth on every deal. So and I'm like 11 and 12 years old, selling furs to these guys. And so yeah, yeah, you you got to learn somewhere. And those guys like they they took care of me. <laughs> The, the, the furriers, that's crazy. And it's it's a very similar sounding to the denim business of uh, grading and measuring and haggling. Perfect intro, really. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is still the same. And there's people that buy one way and people that buy a different way. Like, to me, a number one gene, um, like a number one grade A, whatever, what they used to call it. Like, that's not the best gene to me. The best jeans got some, you know, good wash and those lines in it. Like I remember a guy telling me, Oh, these ones with lines, they're no they're no good. We need just dark. I'm like, no lines, those look better. You know, I didn't know what the Japanese called that whiskers or hige, but yeah, they he would just tell you whatever. No one told me about Big E for like three years. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how did you learn? How, how did you get dobbed into the the knowledge in the world of collectible and, and secondhand denim? I learned by mistakes because there was no internet. There was no reference of what everything sold for on eBay. Um, I mean, I, why people use eBay as a reference for what somebody's asking for a piece, I have no idea. You could look at what it sold for. That might help you, but what someone's asking, that's you know, pretty interesting, but I had to learn from every sale, every buy and sell I did. I learned along the way. And I remember when I learned Big E's, I got 40 pairs of dead stock Big E's in Montana. And I didn't know they were Big E's. I just knew they were, you know, red lines. And I sold them to Max Shapiro, who owned Green for Jeans in the Bay Area. And he'd pay me $400 a piece for them. And I was like, that's, I paid $40 each. I sold them for 400. I was stoked. It was great. But he told me Hell something. Yeah. He said, he said, don't, you, go, you always want to make sure you know what you have before you sell it. I'm like, okay. I, and I didn't think anything of it. And then the next month of the Rose Bowl, this Japanese guy, Ken, came up to me and said, did you sell 40 pairs of dead stock um, Big E's to Max? And I'm like, Big E's? So then he showed me what a Big E was. And I'm like, yeah, I sold them. No, he goes, don't sell them to Max. Sell them to me for a thousand. <laughs> Look, oh, noted. So that's how I had to learn every little thing yeah. I, I learned from buying and selling. You so where where did you find forty pairs of Deadstock Biggies? Oh, well, I, I don't just tell people where I go find stuff. Now that was well, twenty years ago. Uh, it was just like a mom and pop shop, and I think it was um, Gardner, Montana, small town yeah. in Montana crazy you had said before before we fucked up the recording about some one pocket buckle back story and your your one of your mentors had like said no don't sell them to me sell them to this guy so tell that story again yeah well um i i did this as a hobby for a long time like bought and sold vintage and bought at thrifts and yard sales, whatever. And I was selling them to this guy from Thailand, Thai Bobby. And um, I was learning more and more and I would fly. I would just buy for the month. And while I did my other work and then um, I would do that on the side. And then I fly to LA on Thursday, I would sell everything to Thai Bobby on Friday before the Rose bowl. And then on Saturday and Friday afternoon, I would help him sell to Japanese that were coming to his shop. 
I'd help him sell my denim and his denim. And I learned that watching that negotiation and all the prices of everything, that's how I learned. Sometimes like I watch people today that are selling and there's a guy that's, they're buying a lot from them and they're not even paying attention. They're like just talking to their friends and smoking cigarettes. And I'm like, I think you want to watch what the guy's buying and what, you know, like that's how you learn this business. But um, Ty Bobby, um, I, I found two, two one pocket buckle back jeans at a garage sale in Nampa. I got them for six bucks. I brought them there to sell to him. And he's like, yeah, you don't want to sell these to me. They're really good. And I knew they were good, but I didn't know how good. I thought maybe they're like a thousand or five thousand dollars. And um, he's like, sell them to Asakawa. And I'm like, okay. So, because that was one of his customers, Asakawa. And he came and Asakawa, we went to some hotel in Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena because that's where he stayed. And he's like looking at him and I'm thinking, sweet, I'm, you know, this is a good pair of jeans. And he looked at me and says, well, how about 30? And I'm like, 30? My mind's just going crazy. I'm like, 30? I don't know what 30, like 30? <laughs> but he counted out $30,000 on the bed. I'm like, yeah, that's good. So I just played my cards like, oh, yeah. Yeah, cha-ching. Ah. Yeah, that'll work for me. But yeah, they're like, probably. That, that, that was what I was thinking. I saw them in a store late years later for 55000 Wow. With a price tag on them. So good for Are both we talk, of us. Were they, they were Levi's or uh, they, yeah, Levi's, they Levi's? Yeah. Levi's one pocket. Yeah. Wow. So um, that brings me to another question. Everyone loves to know this. I one time was posting, I found in the Guinness book of world records that this was an old one, probably, you know, like an outdated Guinness Book of World Records, but it said the most expensive <laughs> pair of jeans sold was fifty four thousand. I found this on an old thread conversation and you were, you and you commented, <laughs> you're like, you're like, I've blown that out of the water a bunch of times. <laughs> and um, obviously we know that like that's been broken re- even recently with this with the uh, Durango and all that. But like you know, can you give us like one example of like a crazy high price you've gotten for a piece? Uh, I could give many examples, but to me, the funniest part was uh, in the blue gold documentary when Lynn Downey says, these are the most expensive jeans in the world. I'm like, yeah, I'm, like and the oldest and most expensive. I'm like, I probably sold a dozen of those jeans or older. And I know what they paid for them on eBay, which was a great marketing for, the, for Levi's to buy them, but I've paid more for jeans than they have, and I've sold them for more than they have. So, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every year there's probably, it's a small world and people don't talk about it when it gets up to that, but there's probably, I don't know, half a dozen pairs of jeans that sell for over 100,000 every year. Yeah, totally. Uh, and those are just a lot of behind, you know, private private sales with collectors and and everything else. It's it's very interesting that Daco, she's she's in there a little bit, and you know, she's the um, archivist at Levi's, right? For people that don't know, and she does admit in there that she's like, listen, there's a, there's a lot of people out there that know, or there's a lot of collectors that know that might know more than me. She kind of alludes to that in in the Daco, but um, definitely because there was. Levi's had a fire in like what 1890s or something or 1910 or oh uh, yeah it was right before it was the earthquake so I think it's 1906 was the earthquake in San Francisco and yeah. everything it, at 1155 battery burned to the ground and that that was with all their patterns all their documents all their patent stuff probably at that point everything they had was burned so only things that were scattered around America at the time survived so which just got me thinking, you know, I knew that happened and it, it talks about this a lot in the doco, but that probably has added to the allure, the collectability, the mystique of Levi's a lot, because now when you go beyond that period in history, pre-1906, you have to have knowledge and it had to have been pieced together by people like you, by, you know, people like... Um, all the the mine hunters and everybody else who like really goes after these old pieces. Or if you have a 1901 spring catalog from Levi's, 
that's a good resource. You have the 1901 spring catalog. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm just saying that's a good resource. Yeah. Okay. For sure. For sure. And like I when, think that's why a lot of people. Go, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say there's lots of like denim blogs and things I listen to, or even what's even more funny for me is when I'm at a the Rose Bowl or a big flea market or a show like inspiration coming up, and I listen to other people tell when things started and why they're that way and when the lot 501 started and they're just like talking about what they read on the internet because like even Levi's has no idea when the lot 501 started unless you can reference back before then you can figure it out yeah and I think that's super cool. I think that that's great that it has that mystique to it still and that there's there's debates on times, eras, and, and the origins of it. Otherwise, it would be too easy, right? And it, it, it brings a lot more intrigue, in my opinion. Oh, I've, definitely. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I've enjoyed this work and like i feel like i never went to work a day in my life doing this is because i'm still learning even now after 30 years of doing this i learn every week i learn something new like i thought i thought after 20 years of buying um trucker jackets that i knew everything about levi trucker jackets well in three years i bought um like uh, almost a million dollars worth of trucker jackets for levi's and buying that many jackets and having to show that they were made in the US, like I, that was why they hired me to do it, is like I authenticate that they're US made. Um, like I learned <laughs> 10 times what I knew before just from that experience of buying that many pieces over that much time. Like now I'm like, oh yeah, I don't think there's a rule because they were manufacturing in 15 different places in the u.s and some people did things one way some didn't there's there's supposed to be a um, number on the back of the button that tells you what factory it's done in well they didn't always do that and there's, there's lots of jackets that have buttons that are u.s made but they're have buttons from mexico but a u.s made tag in it so there's really i like i don't know that you can define exactly when things happen. Just like there's so many, a lot of people online that say, oh, Biggie's like 1974 or it's 1977. Or I can tell you is nobody went and took the Biggie tags out and put the Smalley tags in at the factory. There's really like a seven year window where there's manufacturing of Biggie tags and Smalley tags because some factories got the tags before, years before the other factories did. Yeah, and and they're not they're not just going to stop using the leftover Big E's. They're like, we use what we got, and then we'll switch it out when we when we're done, right? Because you know, I I, exactly. I manufacture, and that's what I would do if I was switching a tag. You know, you don't want to waste money. Did you ever? Is there a story about why they switched it? Like, is there like a real defined reason? I have no idea why they switched it, but I'm sure it had to do with some lawyer somewhere doing their trademark because the similar thing at the same time was when they started doing a red tab only just with the circle R. And that was so that the red tab would be a trademark for Levi's, not just a red tab that said Levi's. So then they try and they say that like every 12 pairs, this is a story I heard every 12 pairs has the blank red tab. I'm like, there's no way <laughs> every 12 pairs because there's not, I mean, Maybe they do a couple thousand of them a year back then, but they didn't do every 12 pairs. Plus, if you so, manufacture, you know, there's no way you're going to take no the time to do that. Yeah, you're not going to take the time. Every 12 pairs, you're going to switch a tag out? No. Yeah, that's super annoying. That's an extra step for some sewer somewhere. It's just mad annoying. Interesting. Interesting. Um, back to your time in japan and how you learned about japan i want to know like you know obviously japan is a huge is 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 the market and especially back in the 90s they started to create the demand i would say um so how did you 
start to meet these people and then how like you, you I know you've been to Japan a ton. I want to talk about your auction a little bit and like how you started going over there and like meeting these people and it must have been like you had mentioned that your brother went to school there. So like the first time you going there from Boise, Idaho must have been like some culture shock and crazy cool experience. I I actually did a lot of traveling growing up and like I spent a month in Indonesia and like all in all along the Java coast and Sumatra and nice. but my brother went to Osaka University and so I went and spent a couple of weeks with him. I even like to get there. I had to fly something where you like took the luggage of a company and then they had, all you had to pay was three hundred bucks to be able to fly a round trip, but you had to take their luggage through customs when you were there. It was pretty interesting. <laughs> you Is only that got like a, some you like, got, like drug, one, drug smuggling or something? No, nah, it's not <laughs> it's drug not smuggling, but it was like it was a lot of documents and stuff like that back then because that um, you couldn't like email or send stuff back and forth. You had to send paperwork back and forth. And so that's, that was a okay. cheap way to get around and fly was to, um, I can't even remember what they called it. Like maybe it was an escort or something, but you flew, yeah. um, for them and you got to take a backpack with you. That was it. Like your carry on. And, and that's how you did it. But, when I went to Japan the first time, I loved the culture and the people, but I didn't really know anything about vintage American clothing when I went there. Um, and it was um, meeting the Japanese customers of Thai Bobbies in Los Angeles at the Rose Bowl, where I built and um, got relationships with a lot of um, those guys. And I learned from them. They taught me like even more than they told Bobby because they knew I was in Idaho and Wyoming and Utah montana buying all this stuff they were teaching me things like this and that and how much this is you know worth this much more and the hidden rivet and they didn't just um teach me like um how much more they'd pay is they just like taught the transitions too and then um in i don't know i want to say maybe 10 or 12 years ago i was doing some consulting work for j brand jeans and susie crippen one of the co-founders she called up and said, hey, do you want to go to Cone Denim Mills College with us? I'm like, yeah. So Hell I went yeah. back to, I went to Greensboro for a week and we went, we had classes every day and like they explained all the processes and what, how they do it. And they give you a tour of the plant. And, but as soon as like the second day I met this guy who's a scientist, they actually have a real scientist and he does like um, the strand length of cotton and like the weight and how to adjust the weight of the cotton and the strength of the cotton. They had these machines that would drop weight on top of a stretched out denim to, to, you know, to show how much, how strong it was. And I learned from him, literally, I asked him about the details I knew, like, um, like S type, A type, big E's, um, why, you know, why, why was that a thing? And like, why the hidden rivet? And like, literally he told me, he was like in his eighties and he told me like when those transitions happened and why they happened and um, the twisted leg, like to me, the one of the most perfect five ones is the early eighties with that leg twist. Um, I, I love that, but they, they got in trouble for the leg twist and had to get rid of lots of jeans because Levi's didn't want the twisted leg. So it was pretty interesting, but to learn all those so little the details twisted, from the him. the twisted leg was a, was an intentional. I thought it was like a shrinkage. Thing no, it wasn't. It was a shrinkage. Yeah, it went the shrinkage went from ten percent to twelve percent to get a stronger gene, and that caused the um, shrinkage. That's what caused the leg to twist that much. And it was usually oh, wow. just the right leg. Weird. So is cone is cone denim cone mills one of the last real denim manufacturers in America? No, there's quite a few people that still make denim in the U.S. Okay. Cool. Um, and and Cone, Cone really doesn't do it in the U.S. anymore. Now they're like right across the border in Mexico. Oh, really? Yeah. But but you, you the one you went to was still producing. Yeah, they still manufactured there. Because a lot of... Uh, the original denim machines from America have been like exported out, right. And sent to Japan. And yeah, like honestly, I heard that story a hundred times and I went to Oyama in Japan to the denim factories there. 
there's no there's no uh machines from the u.s there not just like, a marketing tactic a marketing oh point. yeah there's a place <laughs> okay. there's a building where there are some machines but there's dust and they ain't use they're not using them they're using modern manufacturing and they they even do their sand horizon of the denim on the thread itself before it's woven which at cone they like make the whole um bolt of denim and then it rolls out and there's a flame that blows on it that um that's how you samphorize denim is have the heated flame on it well they do it on the thread before it's even woven in japan i thought that was pretty interesting wow, but that is there's interesting. hands down the hands down japanese denim is better today than our old u.s denim i think there's some people that just make incredible denim yeah for sure and and you know, I, I, I've worn some, I've seen some, but it talks a lot about, a lot about it in, in the blue gold and the manufacturing process and the dyeing, the indigo dyeing, which is like an ancient Japanese thing as well, um, beyond denim, like into their other textiles. But that's interesting, the samphorize. I didn't know it was a flame like that. And samphorizing is done the, with the purpose of shrinking it, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah. So it literally is just heat. It's heat shrinking the fabric before they manufacture. And it also set the dye into the cotton. Okay. And the thing about indigo and jeans and dye is that it, it wears away. And that's why we get the wear. And that's why you get those hige whiskers, whatever. And like each pair becomes individual to the person is because the, the, the dye will continually leave and wash away or rub away or whatever it is, right? Um, exactly. Which, which I guess is like when you say fast dye means like it doesn't ever come off or, but yeah, fast dye doesn't fade the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Let's, let's, let's jump to your, um, your auction. So you've been doing an auction in Japan for years, right? It went for about 15 years. And it's it's currently done now. Yeah, we we haven't done it for like five or six years now. Okay, and um, that was something that you just you just were like, I want to start this thing up. I want to throw an auction. I want to start selling my shit directly. Or, well, um, there was uh, back at the Rose Bowl way back in the day when I first started there. Um, like the guy Ty Bobby I talked about that I had sold all my vintage to. Um, he went home to Thailand for a month. Well, he didn't come back for three months and I couldn't wait three months. And I talked to him on the phone. He's like, just go to the Rose Bowl and sell it yourself. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. So as soon as I did that, then I never really sold the Thai Bobby again. He also didn't come back for like six months. <laughs> but, okay. Good thing you um, went and sold the stuff. <laughs> right. So, but a guy that I met at the Rose Bowl that was friends with Thai Bobby was from Pocatello, Idaho. Um, Peter Nestis. And um, he was at the Rose Bowl every month. And I called him. I'm like, how do I go sell at the Rose Bowl? Because Ty Bobby said he's not coming back for a while. He's like, hell, he goes, I'll just throw a couple tables in with me. You can go with me. And so I went and sold with him for a couple months. And then I got a space right next to him. And then really the best denim buyers were about seven or eight of us that were all right along the river um, where yeah, which Sammy is, is I, and – what, that's when I started yeah, coming a, to the Rose Bowl. You guys were all there. Yeah, everybody that – all the strong denim bars were all in the same place. But as I watched every morning on Rose Bowl Sunday, those Japanese running, sprinting across the bridge at 4 o'clock in the morning, like coming to get everything they could, I just thought, there's something bigger that we don't know. Like I think that um, we should take good denim to Japan and auction it and – so Max Shapiro, who was on that row, he had a, a dead stock pair of bucklebacks. And so he consigned them with a auction house in Japan. And um, it was a flop. They didn't sell. They sold, but didn't sell for much. But really, it upset a bunch of Japanese dealers that someone would consign their piece in Japan. And uh, But I just thought, what we need to do is have... Um, an auction in Japan, but have it for Japanese dealers, not for the public, yeah. not trying to go around the Japanese 
um, stores and, cust- and, and get to their customers, we want to s- set it up so we have, can sell better and for, at a better price, and they're not having to come to the U.S. And also there's a competition amongst Japanese for the best price as opposed to whatever guy got to your table first. You know, that's, that's really what it was when it came to selling vintage denim then. Um, it, you don't, you didn't know. And I also knew that if there's an auction, the information that I could see of who's bidding and how much they're bidding for, that's why I wanted to have an auction there because that taught me even more about denim and vintage. And we did lots of collectibles as well um, in the auction, but um, going to Japan and having an auction, like, when you see all the biggest players in the vintage market in Japan buying and competing against each other, that's, that's where you get, you know, the kind of knowledge that you get on your phone now. Cause back then we didn't, we didn't have that. There wasn't an eBay or that to teach you or, or see yeah. or not, you know, websites where people talked about values and all those little things. But um, it's, I just started uh, it's leveling there. the playing field, right? It's leveling the playing field and everyone gets a, a fair shot at the same garments and then you get to really, they get to fight it out and you get to see what's going on. Yeah. And actually though, I also learned in doing it that there's a pecking order in Japan when it comes to vintage dealers. And um, even at the auction, you can see it. Um, it's not like a auction in the U S where whoever wants that piece is going to pay the most, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there and there's like fierce competition sometimes at auctions um, in the U.S. But in Japan, there's not, confrontation is not as big um, in their style of doing business. So you could see where people were interested in the same piece, but um, a lot of times if somebody bid aggressively, then the other people would back off pretty quick. So it's just part so, of culturally, it was like that. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So. That is like a social cultural difference where it's they'll they'll respectfully bow down potentially based on like somebody's seniority in the business or respect in the business or something of that nature. Right. Exactly. It's, yeah. There was a, like five or six big companies that would all sit in the very front of the auction rows and like people could pick stuff off in the background. But mostly those guys bought the majority of everything. It still went for more money than what we were selling it for at the Rose Bowl. But um, to me, it was the information of like seeing who was buying what and what they were paying for it. Like that's where I learned the most about um, the vintage business. Yeah, wild. Um, so how many times have you been to Japan then? You must have been like a crazy amount of times. Over, over 50. Wow. And you... In the movie Blue Goal, which I'm going to dive into kind of near the end of the talk, but you are buying stuff in that video to bring at, at some point to bring back to America. Now, was that always something you were doing or was that more like in the la- later years of the business? Well, I, when I would go to Japan, I would always find items, vintage items that were outside of vintage for Japan, like military, like People don't know that I actually probably know more about military collectibles and clothing than I do denim because that's just what I've done as a hobby for years um, with, with military. But in vintage, like there's a lot of military pieces where Japanese will buy them because they're vintage, but they don't necessarily yeah. know the military collectible market. Now it's, a, now it's changed a lot. So pretty much if that's what you do, you can find that information out pretty good, you know, pretty quickly. Um, but back then, like you could go and buy a like a party suit from Vietnam for 50 bucks just because it was a 70s, you know, flight suit. Well, yeah, even now, like when you go, like I just went in October, um, especially like vintage T-shirts. Um, there's a lot of things that don't translate like the our knowledge in the U.S. Um, like we know what it is. And but to some to some shops there they just know it's a 70s t-shirt you know like uh a shoko t-shirt like pretty much everyone knows what that is now because of online but back when i started going i could buy billy graham tees and shoko tees and sell more tees for 25 bucks now it's coming back to new york and selling for four or five hundred yeah crazy. So yeah just 
we when we I've only been once. Me and Jesse went once, and we we went shopping all over the place. There's there's so many vintage stores. It's just overwhelming. You could shop for a month straight and never hit the same store twice. It seems like right. And when I we, when I first started going American Village in Osaka, you probably could shop there for a month and not see everything. That's crazy. And it was it was so fun to shop. You have stores on the main levels. You have stores up on high rises. You have stores below ground. And we were shopping for polo. And polo has always been like popular there. But I think at the time we went, American prices were higher because it's oh, it's yeah. always moving. Like the like the different trends based on geography are very different. And sometimes they follow each other. But if you're pl- if you're timing them right, you can like do the bounce back and forth for sure and make make a buck right yeah no like you if you that's the thing about traveling and in this business you when you travel you meet new people you know what their niche is and what they pay the most for and i like i feel like i can go anywhere and buy and sell like with anybody because like i just have enough friends and relationships in the business that i know who wants what and what they're willing to pay for it and some people think it's silly, but to me, like, I don't, it's a business. Like, like some people act like if you buy from somebody or you sell to somebody, like if you sell to them, that makes you weaker. And I'm like, that's not how this works. Like it doesn't make you weaker to sell to somebody. Not at all, but no, like, not, it's a business. No, not at all. Yeah. Learn, buy and sell and learn, that learn is, more and more. That is uh that mentality is so dripped with ego, you know? And <laughs> It's it, it annoys the shit out of me because I see that with some people and some people who I know should be buying for me but won't buy for me because it's like I don't want them to know that I need their product or I want their product. And it's like this weird ego fucking game. And I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, I'm just out here like you. I'm a businessman trying to make money, have fun while I'm doing it. Well, the majority Very- of people in this business are not businessmen. They're guys that want the drug of buying and selling and by having something that nobody else has. And like, I see pieces like somebody throws up on Instagram and I'm like, why would you even take a picture of that and post it? Do you know what you just gave away? Like that's going to be double RL's theme for the next season, because you just shared what I could have sold for five or $10,000 in pictures in the nineties. They just gave it away on Instagram. Yeah, because no, you can just go there and get the art now, but uh, yeah, but then they, and then they want to sell it for a thousand dollars, and you're like, nobody's gonna buy that for a thousand dollars, and then two or three months later they sell it for a couple hundred bucks, and but everybody already used it. There's people making them now, you know, like the yeah, corduroy, that's the corduroy like, school pants. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they, like those the cor- those are everywhere now. Yeah. I might have saw like a dozen of those in 20 years of doing this business. Now I see 20 a day. It's, it's, uh, it's desensitizing, right? And then you become like not excited about the same things anymore because you're like, I've seen these so many times now and it makes it harder to get excited. And it's a good, you know, um, segue here because i want to know like what gets you excited like because you've seen so much you've seen the one pocket jeans you've had all these old pieces like you know for me i've been doing this 20 years and i've i've never had a one pocket buckle back you know what i mean that's how rare it is but you've you've had all kinds of things that nobody will ever probably see or have the opportunity to see what gets you excited to this day well, there's things that got me really excited back then that don't get me too excited today. Like one pocket buckle backs. Cause you don't get to buy them. Like I remember I bought 22 pairs of teens and twenties jeans from the Sierra Gordo mine in just outside of Bishop, California. The Sierra Gordo 22- mine is bought by that guy. He's on YouTube and he yeah. like fucking, he like bought the town. Exactly. Well, okay. I bought the jeans. There's a changing room. It's like a hundred feet down in this mine and this guy that he and his wife went there because um, she was sick and they just wanted to go live by themselves. In this old ghost town. Well, I, he, he was right when eBay was starting and he put some pictures up online, but they were horrible pictures, but I knew what they were, but I just like got in the car and drove. It's like eight hours from here. I got there. I paid him 14 grand for 22 pairs 
of jeans and they were like stoked and I was even more excited. Like to me, that, that was the thing that back then, now when there's pieces like that, it's hard for me to get excited because I know I got to pay out the wazoo to get it. There's like no crazy good pieces that aren't, that are cheap, but that's not a lot of money left me. To, I'd rather go now and buy a thousand pairs of USA 501s and 400 pairs of red lines and a and hundred pairs of biggies. Like that gets me excited when I can, when I can go spend, you know, 15, $20,000 on a buy. Like I, I get excited about that. Yeah, like a big, a big chunk of stuff that you can do sell to a partner deal that you're working on a project or something, and the single the single piece for paying out ten twenty grand for it nowadays is is. Uh, I don't get excited about that. I mean, I, there's pieces that I find that I want for myself. Um, those sometimes maybe like military pieces. I I collect uh, rigger bags and pieces that guys in the military made in the field like that those pieces excite me but um as far as like any vintage piece i there's not any holy grail i'm looking for you know i love so what artwork. is a, what is a what's a rigger bag explain that so, so they, they would make them in the in the trenches there or? yeah there were, well there's the guys that take care of the parachutes are called riggers and one of the riggers okay. had a sewing machine in the had a sewing machine at the base and guys that needed a bag that um that they didn't have a bag for um one that was functional to do some purpose that they did they would go to the rigger and say hey i need to be able to have to bag this up and the rigger would just make them a custom bag out of other materials from that time period everything from like uh, small duffels to even like toiletry bags um they're all different kind of purpose bags but these guys would make them and they're they were incredible seamstresses like they sewed parachutes all day every day they knew how to sew really well but some of the most amazing design bags are all made by these riggers in world war ii and through vietnam that's sick i wonder I if i've ever had any way, of these and, and i probably shared way too much this. i mean I, I feel like you wouldn't even be able to tell half the time what what it was because a lot of times this might just look like some random folk art custom thing i wouldn't have known yeah that's like it's the weird part about them is like when i see one i like i say oh how much is that well if it's 10 or 15 bucks because nobody knows it's great but when someone wants 400 you're like oh my oh i guess they know (laughs) because yeah Yeah. there's no there's no in-betweeners they're either cheap or they're really expensive yeah fair enough (laughs) <laughs> so speaking about like you're you you do not have any grails you're looking for right now, what is one thing? This is a guest question, okay, from Snags and Stains. He writes, one item that you will never have the balls to get rid of, no matter the offer. You have anything like that? Unlike unlike a lot of other people with their collections, I don't share my collection. I don't let people see it. Because if someone can see it, I think it's gonna be for sale. So my collection is my collection and I don't let people take pictures. I don't let people see it. It's just for me. Crazy. That's, that's super cool. So another thing I was going to touch on before you were talking about like throwing things on Instagram and then like, you know, you've just given it to a designer or whatever, you know, at the Rose Bowl, people, designers come in your blue gold movie. It talks about that a lot. You're selling to designers. We all have sold to designers they buy things and then they fucking make a thousand pairs of reproductions from it or use a detail of it. Right. And the pictures are huge. Sometimes people come in and when the budgets get cut on the design teams, they're like, can I take a picture? And you're like, fuck no, you can't take a picture because pay me for the value of the jeans. If you want the jeans or whatever it is. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, I, I watch people do that all the time today. And I just think, these young guys, you don't even have any idea what you're giving away by hanging up your best graphics all the way around the top of your tent, you know, because these guys, kids come in, boom, 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 boom. And they go home and they print, 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 print. Yeah. You know, I, I don't really see them as much as I used to. Abercrombie and like all these companies used to come through with like three or four people to the bowl. They'd be buying just graphics. Like, I guess this was early days for I, me, but they, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I used to do graphic packages for Hollister, Abercrombie, Double RL. They would just say, oh, we need a maritime theme or we need a military theme or we need a Western theme. And I would put together pictures. Like I, I just took pictures of everything I had back then. I, when I didn't even know how to right click and save, like I would just take pictures <laughs> and put them on my computer. But I would put those together and I'd sell them, you know, a package for like four or $5,000. Well, when Instagram started, that's why you don't see them because all they have to do is hashtag vintage, you know, Western, vintage maritime, vintage military, and they have all those pictures for free. Yeah. It's uh that's why weird, that's why you don't see conundrum. I don't I don't post a lot on Instagram anymore just for that reason. Yeah, if people want to people want to get what you have, they can come to Boise and they can pay you the big bucks. There you go. Quick intermission here from the podcast to talk about one of our partners, Bid Stitch and Easy. Guys, I started my live show again. I'm going live weekly, selling products, giving away products, running auctions, having fun with you guys on the Easy app. It's E Z Z E. Go download it in the App Store and uh, follow my page, Drew Heifetz, and stay notified when I'm going live next because I'm going to be going live weekly. I want you guys to be there. Come have fun with me. Denim. I want to go circle back to denim here. Very important in Japan, right? We've talked a lot about Japan already, but the big thing, they kind of were instrumental in coming to America and then in the 90s, like we've talked about and, and buying denim and like educating people. And really, they were educated before a lot of Americans were on vintage Levi's, from my knowledge, right? Yeah, what I have is two it? friends that's... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Two of my friends started this business, like literally one in Tokyo, one in Osaka. And they came to the US and bought and bought and bought. And then they go back and sell and they're still in business. They still have stores. They're still a couple of the most famous Japanese um, denim store owners in Japan. But in the US, they like kind of like fly under the radar. Like they don't, yeah. they don't want to be that guy. So do you think that it was basically their, it, their brainchild instrumental in like just build, building this business from the ground up? Or was it something about the culture there that hit or yeah. Like what is it about? Why, why was it Japan? Why wasn't it the UK or why wasn't it some other country that like built the business? Well, if you've been to Japan, it's not just jeans. Like Japan has gone around the world and bought the best of everything in the in the whole world and recreated it and manufactured it there. And that's how Japan built themselves out of World War II when they were destroyed and their men didn't have any manufacturing. They in Japan, like I this is what I learned about Japan. Japan has a business plan that's a hundred years long. Not like yeah. Americans would think like a year or the majority of people in our business are like getting through the month, right? For their business plan. <laughs> but um, as Americans, we might think of a five or 10 year business plan, maybe 25, but Japan has a hundred year business plan. And so they went and bought all of the best of the best, brought it back, studied it. And for every detail, they did those details to make the best of the manufactured items and like and so in the 50s and 60s and 70s, almost everything that was the best of the best came from Japan because that was the best manufacturing, especially in electronics and, you know, all that. But um, that that's part of their culture is to have the best of the best, to collect the best of the best. And if you like go try to find like vintage cars and motorcycles and everything that we love as Americana, like almost all the best of the best is in Japan. Not just jeans. Such an interesting point. The hundred year business plan, because the, the hundred year business plan is going to outlive any one person, right? So if, you, if you're 30 years old and you're putting together a hundred year business plan, you know, you know that that legacy is going to live beyond you, right? 
Americans yeah, no, do think, not have that in their DNA, man. We don't. We're like, we no, we're don't. so selfish, right? Exactly. And I think doing business in Japan is what helped junkyard jeans to survive this long. Like small business is hard. Like when you work for yourself, have a half dozen employees, it's, it's difficult. And there's been like a dozen times in 30 years where I just wondered, what in the world am I going to be doing next month? Because this ain't working. You know, and we had to recreate who we are and what we're doing. But um, to watch them and to do business in Japan, um, like it allowed me to realize. Um, and they taught me, actually, one of my friends, Ii Asakawa, he said, the relationship is more important than the product. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, our relationship is more has more value than our business. And I, I didn't, it took years for me to understand that. But um, today, and especially going through COVID, I realized like I would never even be able to do this business if I didn't have those relationships and trust between people. Like I could send $10,000, $15,000 worth of product to customers without being paid. I know I'm going to get paid and vice versa. Like if you don't have that, those kind of relationships, like you're not building anything in this business. If you're like hustling and finding good pieces and trying to get a, the most amount of money out of every piece, like you're missing the boat. Like the more important part is um, being able to sell everything you buy and know where you're going to sell it before you're buying it and have that kind of relationship where you could say, call up your customer and say, Hey, I got this and this and this, and you're shipping it. You're not like shopping it to a hundred different people on Instagram you know, trying to get the, another 50 bucks out of it. And cause that's great now, but when there ain't no Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's uh, <laughs> the, you know, the exact opposite of the hundred year business plan is to like, exact like, like pull the blindfolders over somebody, you know, dupe them on a price, do a bad deal, you know, for an extra 50 bucks or some, some shady thing where it's like that, that won't put you, into the next deal with that potential person where the hundred year business plan, like you're saying is, yeah, like create those relationships and, and, and take care of each other, essentially like ha help exactly. each other out, you, you know, I, in the class at FITM, um, I did a, a class on sustainability because, uh, you know, a few years back, like sustainability was the word of the day, right. For everybody of course, we talked yeah. about sustainability and um, sustainability is a great thing. But to me, sustainability is being in business that much longer and making sure the people that you're doing business with, that they're, that they're doing well too. Because like I, I would go to do some work for a high-end um, fashion brand and we would fly into um, North Carolina. We would go to this factory that was like 50,000 square feet and they would fly me there business. I would stay in a fancy hotel. We'd drive in a rental car that was like 400 bucks a day. And we'd go in this factory and talk to the owner. And in the factory, they're using about 3000 square feet of the 50,000 square feet. And in the parking lot, there's six cars, but there's a hundred people in there sewing. And the people that are there sewing, they like eat their, you know, lunch, from a bag and the man, the guy that owns the factory, he's just trying to get enough money to keep his workers working. And um, it's like, that's not how this is supposed to work. Like the, the company that's getting the product made used to be like in the fifties and older was in a partnership with the manufacturer. And when that, when the brand sold good, the manufacturer did good as well. But it's like, because there's manufacturing overseas, Everyone's trying to cut it just as cheap as they can to make, you know, the product that they need to. And uh, to me, that's like um, a de-evolution of denim. Like up to about 86 was as, as efficient and as good as it could be, the 501. But after 86, just started like devolving. All these things change to yield more denim from the cotton, to yield more jeans from a bolt. Like literally just those things that devolve um, what they were trying to do for a hundred years to make the best. Now they're like, you know, devolve from making the best. Now it's a consumable. 
So as far yeah. to me, and as far not, as meant, uh, not meant to last, meant to be thrown out fast so you can buy another pair. Right. But, but to me, sustainability is like, is not, is not the way that's being done. Like they talk about like using water to wash and all these other things like sustainability is like just being in business and taking care of your employees and ha- and being a good businessman. Like that's what's sustainable. When you start making those shortcuts and doing those things, that's that's not sustainable. Yeah, that's uh, it's funny when you when you said sustainability in the beginning of this talk, I was like, which way are you going to go here? Because yeah, there's there's sustainable to the environment, there's sustainable to your your business. You know, sustainability just means something that can last forever. So it's like exactly you're saying yeah, being sustainable yeah, the to first... the business in general. Yeah. And, I was at a show in New York yeah. like 10 years ago and I saw for the very first time this laser that machine that jeans would they lay them down in there and this laser would burn a wash into the jeans and the smoke would like go up in this box where the jeans are in and they're talking about how how much it was going to save the environment by not using water and I'm like where in the hell is all that smoke going you know like the, yeah, the denim like oh. actually burns and smoke goes up like that's just that's can't be good like you can filter water and reuse it but what about that all that smoke like didn't even make sense to I, me. Tell, I you know this this talk can go for hours and hours because there's so many there's so many every everything has its own negative and everything has its own positive and you can like put a spin on any one thing to make it sound better than the other thing right and that's kind of what people are doing with the marketing of sustainability currently it's like we're always just spinning something else into something better than the other thing but what i took away from what you're saying is that what's really sustainable is first of all to be to be uh to be an honorable business who takes care of its people which is very important and i've i've had my own sort of inner struggles and workings to get to there myself because i want to be that i want to be someone who takes care of the people and i want to work with good people right i think that's like super important but also what i took away from what you said was that it's like to own quality the thing doesn't have to be like some eco material but if it's super super quality and you can wear it for 20 years you don't have to go buy another one that is way more sustainable. That, that's and, sustainability. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I wear a pair of I wear a pair of jeans from the 80s. I could wear them for five years. You buy a brand new pair of jeans today, it's gonna last you like three or four months. Maybe. If you work in them, maybe three or four weeks. Yeah. But and yeah, that, to me, like that's what sustainability is. And it tailors back to why, well, this business in general, because the things that we sell, the things that garner value are typically those things. Like, you know, when you look at a brand like Filson, you're like, those jackets fucking last forever. They're they're super tough. You know, you can wear that thing. The Levi's, the old work pants, you know, a duck canvas hunting jacket. They were made for a purpose. They last and they hold value. Yeah, I, all the time um, people ask me questions like, what I'm buying, what do I buy and sell? What's changed through the years? And you know what, like, honestly, I'm buying and selling the same stuff I've done since I started. And it's because those are the core pieces that have the retained the most value because of it stood the test of time. Like literally there's pieces in every category that are the best pieces in that category. And those are the go-to pieces. And I'm not running around looking for Bart Simpson bootleg t-shirts, you know, and that kind of thing. But like, it's those pieces that that have lasted for 40 or 50 years and are going to last another 40 or 50 years. Yeah, totally. I love it, man. And that's sustainability and that's why you're still doing it. Okay. I have a, I have, I'm going to jump to a guest question here. This is from Haley, your daughter. Oh no. Are you serious? I'm in trouble. Who is your, who is your favorite daughter? (laughs) That's what, that's what she writes. Oh, man. You know, uh, you honestly, I could. Well, because Haley asked the question, I'm going to say Haley. But nice. I have four kids, and like I couldn't ask for four better kids in the world than my kids. And like to me, that's like my my rock, and my wife is the reason why of my success. She like 
has made sure that I'm on the straight and narrow always. And like yeah, to me, that's, that's like amazing. all the, all, that's my treasure. It seems like, is there any, do you have any like treasures or the most value? I'm like, yep. It's at home. It ain't you know, here. In the movie, I, I, you were like traveling at one point and you said like, I'm going, I'm, I just want to go home to be with my kids and my family. Uh, and I did have that to talk about. Cause you, yeah, you have four kids, you're a family man. And you've also been sober. You said for 20, some, since the eighties, since 86 or something. Eight, 1986. Yeah. Which I commend you on that, you know? Um, so yeah, like, you know, family is very important to me too. And I know it's, it can be tricky to balance when you're a self proprietor, like yourself running your own business, hustling, traveling, what's the, the balance been for you or any tips or thoughts on that? Um, honestly, I tell you is if you're working for yourself, like that's the secret is keeping the balance. Cause it, no matter how you do it, or try to do it, it's going to get out of balance. And you have to just keep going back to making sure that there is a balance in your life and that those people in your home know that they're the most important thing. And that, like my kids, I remember I flew home once from New York to have a, a daddy daughter dance at school and flew back the next day. And my daughter no, still talks about that to this day. She knew that the daddy daughter dance was more important than the business in New York. And like, it's hard to, it's hard to have that balance, but as long as you recognize that you need to be in balance and you're constantly adjusting so that you have that balance, like that's really the most important thing. Yeah. That's amazing, man. You know, I think that memory, like you said, she's talks, talks about it all the time and that memory was so important that you created that you took the energy it's so easy to say i can't do it i'll be at the next one you know and then not go but it those are like pivotal moments in our family's development in our kids lives you know and i, I don't think there's ever a point where your kids will think you love them too much it's like there is no too much it's like the love is so important and i don't know that's heartwarming man that you did something like that no, well, that's, I mean, at the same time, I'm not trying to say like I'm the greatest dad ever because I'm sure there were, since my kids are asking questions, I'm sure there were things that I missed too. But I always wanted them to know that irregardless of what I was doing or where I was at, that they were the first thing on my mind. And that's one of the reasons why I work the way I do, why I have that kind of work ethic. And the reason when I'm traveling and I'll work, you know, 12 or 14 hours a day isn't because... I just work that hard. It's because if I work like that, I can go home two or three days earlier than, you know, if I was working eight hours a day. Like, I don't even know how people show up at the Rose Bowl at nine or 10 o'clock and expect to find anything, you know, or to do business. I, I laugh all the time. <laughs> A design team comes at like 10 o'clock and they're like, we can't find any small U.S. jeans. I'm like, that's because I had them all by six. Yeah, they're like, we, but we just had brunch. We had mimosas at brunch. It was great. <laughs> like, like, what? Exactly. <laughs> uh, they're going to so, bed when I'm getting up. Yeah, you know, and I know you are you are a Rose Bowl hustler. You are a 14 hour day Rose Bowl guy, and I I did hear that somebody threw again. I think this was Liz, shout out um, Liz Baca, busy lady Baca. She says, talk, oh no, this was actually from Himmel, but shut up, is shut up, Baka, she had some other questions in here. <laughs> Himmel says, talk about buying, uh, talk about buying product in hotel rooms in Pasadena, but also how you can sneak into the Rose Bowl so early. Well, I used to have to sneak in when I, to buy because um, I didn't have a ticket to sell there I was just buying so I would get in a car with somebody else who had his you know spot and just ride in with them but what Himmel's probably talking about is when he went with me to the Rose Bowl I think there's like eight Japanese guys that all jumped in the back of my van out in the parking lot so that they could be in before four o'clock and start shopping so yeah that's nice. what we used to do that yeah you gotta have the inside tip speaking of sneaking in this is the busy lady Baca question. She says, uh, 
How did you sneak into Brimfield? You're just the man sneaking oh, no. into events early. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I don't want to say, I don't want to tell all my secrets to sneak into Brimfield, but I think what I shared with Liz once was that on the third day there was this show that was in the afternoon, so like everything's done and people are like waiting in line for like two hours, right? And I'm just sitting there going, "There's no way I'm going to wait here this long." But at that in that field, they had a restaurant like right on the fence. So like the back of the restaurant was in the inside and the front was outside. So people could come get stuff while they're waiting in line. So now I watched this guy, like he just walk right up there and he opened the door and went in. He's like, I'm, I'm here to work on, to do the fries. And they're like, okay, get your apron. And he went in the back and got his apron and he came out and I was like, sweet. So like I waited about 10 minutes and I went, opened that door and walked right in and said, hey, I'm here to work and clean up. And they're like, go back, go back and get an apron. I went, walked back there and walked right out the back door. And all my friends are standing out there in the line. And they saw me shopping inside. It was pretty fun. Hey, where's that guy who's supposed to be cleaning <laughs> up? <laughs> get over here and do some dishes. <laughs> oh, fuck. That's awesome. Uh, so while we're on the kind of the Rose Bowl and flea market vibe, I think – there's a story of you with the near death. This is this this question comes from three world thrifts. There's a near death experience with a U-Haul. Was this like on the way to Rose Bowl or something? Uh, I don't know. There's probably a half a dozen near death experiences, but probably what um, they're referring to is my brother in law went with me to um, Portland. We bought two thousand pairs of jeans, and that's a, just about what will fit inside a 15 passenger van is 2000 pairs of jeans. And that's like we crazy had, that you know that number. <laughs> well, I told I, dr- I drove one of those vans for, I don't know, 15 years, but yeah. we filled it up completely to where the jeans were like around us and in between us. Like you could just steer and drive. And that was about it. And we like got up early and we're driving to LA to sell them. And we came around the corner, um, to the golden gate bridge and the traffic was like completely backed up and i was like and i'm not gonna get stopped in time and i'm like pushing on the brakes and uh, all the jeans came like all the way forward on us and like pinned me against the steering wheel and like my brother-in-law is freaking out because he's like pinned against the dashboard and there's like 40 or 50 feet left and i'm like slammed my hand into the dash so i could get off the steering wheel to turn it and i just barely missed the car and we came to a stop, but we're still freaking out because the jeans are, have us like pinned to the front. And I said, well, just a second. And my brother-in-law was like crazy. I put it in reverse and I sped up and I slammed on the brakes and they all fell back and we were good. <laughs> Went right back <laughs> to like, the place. Okay, here we go. Game on again. Let's keep going. <laughs> Jeez, that's crazy, man. Yeah, so I almost had, got death uh, by jeans. Death by jeans. 2,000 pairs of jeans. <laughs> Death by denim. Down. Yep. Wow. That's crazy. And when you're loaded that, when you're loaded that full too with that, like 2,000 pairs of jeans, that's like a few, th- a couple thousand pounds of weight in the back of your truck too. That pushes you pretty good. It's, not, it's hard to stop. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Crazy. Well, we're, we're glad. Death uh, by denim. Glad made it through that one. Death by denim. Death by denim. Um, you know, one question was, this was from Jesse, actually. He wanted to know, like, the single biggest haul. The single biggest quantity haul or, like, one, like, crazy dig that you had that you're like, that one was the mother load. Um, I really can't tell you the single biggest one because those people are still in the business and they might not feel good about it. But probably the, probably the biggest ever was... Early on when I went to the Rose Bowl, there was uh, people that called me from, man, the middle of, they're like the middle of nowhere, California, Gilroy, California. And this guy's like, you buy old denim jeans? I'm like, yep. And he's like, well, we, we got like a bunch of storage units that we bought and we have all the denim here. And some of it's the red lines and some of it's the Big E. Like they knew they could get online and see some of it, but they wanted to sell everything. So I drove there on the way down and uh, they had like, there's probably a thousand pairs of single stitch 517 and big E's and 505s and 
there's lots of red line and V and double X and all that as well. But I only had like $30,000, but it was over a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff. And so I bought everything that I could fit in my truck to go to the Rose bowl. Cause I was on my way there. And I just said, I'll buy this right now and I'll be back in three days to get everything else. So then I went there, I sold all I could at the bowl, went back to Gilroy and got a U-Haul truck, like a big U-Haul truck. I'm like, probably want to say 20 feet or something. And we filled that truck full of jeans. And that probably took me six or seven years before I sold all those jeans, but it was incredible. It was half a million dollars of the jeans. Wow. That's crazy. And when you get a deal like that, you gotta, you gotta, gotta take it and you gotta f- be ready to take something like that. Cause that's a, that's a huge haul, man. Well, and back then too, is like all the sm- like smalls were no good. If it was under 30, like you couldn't hardly sell under 30, but they had a lot of them and I just still bought them, but I just bought them for cheap. And then like a few years later, um, urban outfitters wanted to do shorts and I sold almost all of those smalls for 10 times what I bought them for to be made into shorts for urban outfitters. So nice. if something's of value and it's, I've heard, and it's quality, even if it's not. Yeah. Go ahead. I've heard that urban outfitters was buying so much denim for so many years. Cause they were like anticipating the decline in availability of Levi's, you know, especially in their size range cause they're selling women's shorts. So they've like, you know, the rumor was they were just filling warehouses with the good size denim to just monopolize denim shorts because it's a staple of their business. Uh, yeah, I've, I heard a lot about that too. And I even heard there's 70,000 jeans still in Columbus that are all smalls. Nice. <laughs> uh, now, now I want to talk about the They're looking for them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> buy a ticket to Columbus, Expedia. um i want to talk about the the um the doc now blue gold you know this is a big topic because everybody a lot of people have probably watched this it came out in 2017 if i'm correct was it 17 yeah i think so yeah for me it's it's like a five or six year long process so it also like when it came out into film festivals and i i traveled all over doing film festivals and meet and greets and Q and A's and being like, so to me it was like, it came out over like a couple years span, not just when it went on Netflix. Yeah. And so, you know, the, it, it's a great show. It, I've watched it a few times. It follows you in your experiences. It goes with you to the Rose Bowl, to Japan, to New York. And then it's, and then intermittent, they like give the whole history of denim, like through all these other like interviews, which is very educational, really. Um, so it, it kind of has like two vibes. It's like the vibe of like a travel doco vlog thing with you about your life and then all this history sp- sp- interspersed. Um, so ev- everyone should go watch it. I'll put a link down below so you guys can like link to the movie and go watch it. But how did that happen? Like, you know, how did, did one day this come to you at Rose Bowl and go like, we, we want you in a dock? Like what's, how did this all go down? Well, Christian, the producer came to the Rose Bowl and talked to lots of people and met a lot of people and took pictures and Christine Detlefson, who is his, I think he's a cousin. They're related, but um, she was the one that knew almost all the LA dealers because she was in the fashion world and she did a lot of design and she's, actually does design denim now in Europe and has crazy clientele there. Um, but um, that's how I met them. But then they just, they came and they started videoing at the Rose Bowl and he had to sign a waiver or whatever to be a part of it. And there's probably 10 or 12 dealers that they all came and videoed for the day. And um, then they wheeled, like weaned it down to like six and then pretty soon it was down to me and Zach. And um, that's when they started doing most of the shooting and following us around. And then for one reason or another, it didn't work out with Zach. And so it ended up just being me. So, but there's Crazy. like, so I, I think they said they had like 600. Basically a... 
I didn't know it was an audition either. I, they were just following me around with what I did. Yeah. And Zach's in it for a minute. You're talking about Zach. Uh, yeah, he has like a few clips in it for yeah. sure. Yeah, he was in, and he's in all the trailer stuff. And he was a big part of it in the beginning. Like, I watched the film three different times when it was like completely different. Like, and the thing too is like, I learned a lot about documentaries as we did this because most documentaries, the people don't have the money to go out and like just do the documentary. So literally like, as you see blue gold, you'll see who they got money from all through the show. Each one of those people that they're talking to are people that gave money to the show. And then they got to put in like their two cents of whatever they wanted to promote and do. Um, but you see that all the way through the show. But for me, like my part was I wanted people to understand and know like that your genes are really what tell the story and the history of you. Like that's the real value and character in denim. And Christian and I talked about that over and over and over. And he's like, I think we need to tie this in with the world. Like the whole world wears jeans and it's that way. And that's how the Bruce Lee interview came into it with Tom Snyder. And to me, that like this was the coolest part ever because I'm in a movie with Bruce Lee. Like I grew up yeah. in the Bruce Lee fan club and I love Bruce Lee like my whole life. And like that Bruce Lee is in that film is just, that's my man card for life. <laughs> <laughs> that's my epic, my dude. great great grandkids, yeah, my great great grandkids could say, "Oh, my great great grandpa was in a movie with Bruce Lee." Did you ever think like it would go on to be on Netflix? Did, was that the plan from the jump, or were they just kind of like, "We're going to hope for the best, go to some festivals and see what happens"? I think they just go to festivals and see what happens, and they did well. And uh, I don't know. Obviously, it's not my business, and I didn't sell the film to Netflix, but. Um, yeah. people say, well, like, did they make a lot of money? I'm like, I don't know how much money they made, but I can tell you this. I went to his apartment in LA a few times, but after they sold it to Netflix, his apartment was the one right underneath the penthouse of the Nakatomi Plaza, like the CNN building on sunset. Yeah. It was the apartment right below it. About 20 <laughs> grand a month. <laughs> so yeah, the, it, he did. Okay. He did. Okay. I think so. I think so. You know, when I asked you to do the podcast, um, you're like, I got to, I got, you got to email me because I got to ask my agent, obviously now, because you did this movie and you have an agent. So that's like probably a whole new thing for yourself, for sure. I just have to run things by them. And also like, they're also pushing me to make money when I do things like this. But to me, I think with my friends and people that I do business with, like that's, you get paid that way. Like I don't have to charge people. Like usually anything else, I get 1500 bucks a day to go talk to some place or to go do a Q and a about the film or anything like that. It's like the daily rates, 1500 bucks. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. If anybody wants uh, Eric to show up at their kid's birthday party or uh, talk to their class <laughs> or edu educate their staff on, how to sell jeans potentially. Yeah. I think that's super valid, but the other thing is to like, it's not yeah. my 1500 bucks is a full day of work. Like it's not like showing up and doing some or like six or eight hours. It's like 14 hours. Like I work for you the same way I work for myself. Oh, and I, to me, that seems like completely undervalued. I feel like you're worth more than that to go for a day and do a talk, you know? I remember when it came out at the Rose Bowl. Cause I remember now, like when you came to that Rose Bowl after the film came out, it was kind of like, oh shit, every, obviously anybody in the business had watched the film, plus lots of the public, because Netflix is just a pretty generalized, very popular streaming platform. Everybody watches it. So you kind of went from like, you know, your, your well known vintage dealer to like, now you're just like a well known guy, right? Who's on Netflix. So, how was that transition and you know, how did things change? Uh, the phone rang a lot more from people that you don't know and, but they know you, which is kind of weird. Um, like I can't even imagine what like being a real entertainer and really famous would be like, but um, like even going to the Rose Bowl sometimes when that first happened, there'd be people that follow us around and like try to get in the background and get a picture, stuff like that. And that was, um, kind of weird. I don't mind like people coming and saying, Hey, like 
really loved your show and like you're you know say nice things like that's really cool but then they want to get a picture which is just fine too but after you do that then there start people lining up to you know talk to you and get a picture and i, I can't do that when i'm at the rose bowl because i'm trying to go to the next booth and the next booth and the next booth to find stuff so it was kind of weird luckily my son was helping me a lot then and so he was pretty good about helping me to be able to get away from that but that at nice. the same time like whenever anybody stops you and says, Hey, you're, you're like the inspiration for me being in this business. And I'm like, that makes me feel great. I mean, I'm so happy because I had people who inspired me to get into this and I have the same kind of love and admiration for them for taking the time to show me and share with me the things that they knew. And, and that's why I'm not afraid to do that now. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's really cool. Did it, did it help business? Did you, did you get deals from it potentially? Oh, no, I, I still get business from it. It actually just last year, um, went transferred to Hulu. Maybe it was a year or two years ago. And there's like a whole nother base of people who don't have Netflix, who have Hulu, because it started all over again, the same kind of energy. But mostly it was in Europe and South America, where everybody watches Hulu. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think I watched it on Netflix originally, and then I recently just watched it on like iTunes or something or apple download. yeah i think uh i think itunes and i don't know i don't even know all those yeah. platforms. well anyway we'll we'll link it down below for anybody to to jump on there um so you know i can imagine too because you're like very deep in the business and this was still a few years ago and you're taking these camera people to japan you're setting them up at the rose bowl was there like pushback from certain people about like having these guys with you and um yeah like was, was anybody pissed that you were like no you know the cameraman? well the thing was i did i didn't take them anywhere that i didn't have a relationship and the people weren't my friends to begin with anyway yeah but I learned really quick, especially in New York, how many people wanted to be on film and be a part of it. And the business that I could do on, on with being filmed was really good because literally they would, uh, um, like I would get deals being filmed and like legit deals that I was buying for way cheaper than if I, and I'd even buy stuff that I know they would never have sold me otherwise. They would they'd sell it to me because it was in the film. Yeah, and then probably like tons of that stuff gets cut anyway, and you're like, yeah, I got the deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome. We also we we did like three different TV reality show shoots too, and like the places that we went to for that was the same thing. People like just give it away because they want to be on TV. So what happened with that? Was that just like a pilot and never went through, or was it? Uh, yeah, it just didn't work out. And one of them was because I don't swear. <laughs> like the guy who did the uh, biggest loser. Yeah, the guy that's like the producer of the biggest loser show. He was like, we did three different pilots. With, like we shot three different pilots. And like at, at the third one, he's like, would you don't swear? I'm like, no, I don't swear. He goes, you never swear. I'm like, I'll swear, but I'm not going to swear on TV. Like I got four young kids. I don't, and I don't swear. So like the last thing I'm going to do is swear on TV. And like, that was it. He didn't want nothing to do with it. That's so crazy. How does that translate to the only thing that makes good TV? I don't know. Like Kyle, I think he could make TV. Yeah. <laughs> I watched yeah. Kyle's, Kyle's interview the other day. I was like, oh yeah, he could have, he could have had a show on TV. <laughs> oh, shout out Kyle for dropping He swears a little ball. bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> The um, what was the premise of the reality show? Kind of like American Pickers, but clothing vibes, or was it different? Um, no, it's kind. Of, it was actually more like uh, the Deadliest Catch. You know how like they have a time frame and so many that they got to do. Well, we do like project after project after project, and they have to go out by a due date. And we work with a lot of famous people, so that was their thing. Was who we're doing a project for when it has to be done. And there was like a, this time code part in it where we had to keep things going to get it out on time. So it was pretty great. It was a great idea and a good concept, I think. But I, like the guy just at the end of the day wanted someone that swore and he wanted to have, the other thing was he wanted me to have sexual tension. 
with um my store manager and i was like nah like yeah i don't have on. sexual tension with my store manager and i'm married with four kids like yes she's young and gorgeous but we don't have sexual tension she's like oh i can see it like you can't you can't see it because it ain't there but that's what they wanted and i'm like i, I got nothing uh. to do with that that's so, yeah, imagine if that show comes out and then you have to like go explain to all your family like and like extended family like, oh no, that's just, that was manufactured sexual tension. It's not real. Like who wants that? Yeah, I don't want any part of that. The other thing was in Blue Gold even, um, we, when we went to um, go to the auction, Christian got out and wanted to just film me showing up with his translator. With his translator, this 30-year-old girl that's really attractive and I'm like, I'm not going to come like showing up in a taxi with her. Like, that's not going to look good. And he's like, what do you, what do you mean? I'm like I'm in another country and I'm showing up at my auction with some young, good looking girl. <laughs> like that ain't going to look good. Yeah. Straight so up. They, they took care of it for me. Uh, we're going to jump to a guest question here. We got this one coming from Leon vintage co. Uh, this is, I found a pair of Levi's 505s with a salvage coin pocket. Are they big E? The red tab is gone. Is that? I don't, I don't know if they're big E, but they probably are big E. But there's a few things you can do to tell if they're big E's. And that's on the salvage inside on the seam is if it's single stitch on both sides of the red line, then more than likely it's also a big E. And then also the R on the button will have a short leg instead of two long legs. And that's, those are good guidelines. If there's no red tab, biggie. All right. Getting some, uh, some and the Levi's other thing though is like, here. well, that, that's one of the things like people find a biggie, but doesn't it have a biggie tag? Like they still want a biggie price for it. I'm like, nobody who buys biggies wants to buy a biggie with no red tab. Like, you can't get the same price yeah. for that as you can for one that has one but yeah no one seems to understand that <laughs> that goes back to you know it's a good thing to quickly touch on but that goes back to the same thing about like checking prices and stuff if you're going to check the same price that has a perfect condition with the tab on it you're not going to be able to get that for something without the tab denim is like one of the most subjective markets i i don't know how you feel about it but because of size condition wear minute details like it's very subjective to so many factors and you can't just it's really the value of things can go up and down so much depending on these different factors so it's like you can't just compare apples to oranges right every week somebody asks me on the phone how much do you pay for levi's i'm like how much do you pay for a used car <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> it's the same thing <laughs> Like you, there is you no Ford like, or you exact price. Yeah, right. That's crazy. It's the same. Like yeah. there's so many factors that it really, I, you have to see the genes to tell. And that goes back to like the 10,000 hours of doing something. You only can gain that denim knowledge from holding it, touching it, being around it. You can read all the books, but you got to like immerse yourself in it to like really see those and understand them. In my opinion. Okay, next or question. Or you can look is, on Instagram. Um, this, yeah, now you can just look on Instagram. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Snags and Stains. This is another one from Snags and Stains. If you could wear, I like this question. If you could wear one outfit for the rest of your time, what shirt, pants, jacket, sweatshirt, etc., are you wearing? Who is it asking me this question? The guy's name is Snags and Stains. Uh, I don't have any outfits. My outfit is my truck. So, like, I just wear what I wear. So I don't have an outfit or a costume. Like, sometimes I go to those shows, <laughs> I feel like I'm at a cosplay convention. <laughs> yeah, totally. But my, out, my outfit is my truck. Uh, okay, so he's always, he's always repping the truck. Um, I do, I've seen you, you know... You you have like a classic style, a t-shirt and jeans kind of guy. Sometimes though, I've seen you in some in some military, some cool military pieces over the years for sure. Um, it does get pretty costumey though at these events for sure. We're gonna see it again <laughs> soon. Inspiration. Yeah, next next month, right? <laughs> next month. Come yeah. to the come to the denim cosplay convention. 
I'm excited for inspiration to see because it's now been like five years, right? Since the last one or four yeah. years anyway. So it's a long time. See, it's cool to see the evolution now and then who's coming to buy now and how Ridden markets it now and all these different factors. I'm excited to uh, be a part of it. We're going to be there well, that, for sure. I mean, that's the thing that I love most about inspiration though, is like you see all your old friends and then also you meet a lot of new people and that, those young new people that are getting into this, like I love to see their excitement and their energy and it just like helps me to work even harder. So are you going to be set up or just buying? Just buying. Cool. Okay. Um, we're into the time in the show where I ask everyone the same set of questions. Okay. Sort of quick fire questions. You ready? All right. Okay. So this is who is your greatest of all time in the vintage game for male and female? A male and female like, greatest like mentors or someone you look up to in the business. Yeah. Um, actually it's a married couple and it's Ron and Cindy Wright from, from boss vintage in Denver, Colorado. Okay. Great. Shout out Mary and C Cindy. You said Ron and Cindy, Ron and Cindy. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were on the front of a people magazine holding a pair of $25,000 jeans when, before I even did this. And I was like, Oh man, that's so cool. Are they still around? Cindy passed away a couple of years ago, but Ron um, still has Boss Vintage in Denver. Boss Vintage. Okay, dope. Um, who would you say is most underrated or like your ch pick for rookie right now? Like rookie of the year? Kyle. Okay. Shout out Kyle. Um, we already asked you about your most prized grail, but you're not going to share it because your collection is only for you. But I, D I, mean, I have a lot did, of prize. Dave I have Himmel a lot of asked, pieces like that are nice, but go ahead, Dave. Question. He said he's well. He he said, "Tell us about the jeans hanging in your office." <laughs> you got to be you in my office those? to see the jeans hanging okay. in my office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. So, if you want to see. The oldest pair of jeans hanging in the office. You have to go drop a wad and do an appointment with Eric. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you. They're buckle backs made in Boise, Idaho, um, like in the early teens, and they're Letter Buck brand. Okay, sick. Letter Buck brand. Never had a pair? Letter Buck. I don't even know if I've heard of, heard of them. Sounds amazing, though. What's the worst trend currently in the vintage scene? The worst trend, uh, stretch denim. Okay. What is the best trend currently to you in the vintage scene? The best trend is buying jeans from junkyard jeans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Last question uh, is if you could go on a picking trip with any three people, you probably mostly ride solo. You're probably going with your son most of the time. You can pick your son, but who would you bring on a Digging trip, top three. Wow. You know what? Um, at Festivus, Brian from Snappy Gat or from Hollywood Vintage, Brian, look, we had the best time. And like with you, I, I never laughed so hard in a long time. Like <laughs> I would love to take Brian only because his world is quite a bit different than my world. I mean, we both buy the same things, but he's on another level for what he does. And he's looking yeah. for a lot of things that I'm not necessarily looking for. So he will be really fun to be on the road. And then anymore, uh, more than anything, I would just like to go up with my son as well, because he could schlep everything where I'm just getting old. I can only carry like a hundred pounds of jeans anymore. Yeah. That's uh, and the third you know, your son, your son, that, your son I, was there in Durango. It was so cool to see you guys working together, but who's your third? Third, um, third would be um, Kenji from Banana Boat because he has all the money in the world. So no matter what we found, we could get it. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, awesome. Price wouldn't matter. 
and the, ma- the amount wouldn't matter. Like we could just get it no matter what. Wow, amazing. Is he the one that you spend the most time with in the doco? Uh, we spent some time there, um, but Hitoshi is the one that um, we spent a lot of time with in the documentary. Okay. Um, um, Banana Boat Kenji, I, in October, I was able to go back to Japan and like literally he took me around and I was able to buy things so many so much denim in japan and bring it back to the u.s like what i talked about in the film like someday i'm going to be there buying this all back like he helped me to do deals and do just exactly that amazing uh any last shout outs for the people any any last words before we end it here thank you so much for the Uh, for coming on with me man you bet the one thing i that could help me is i'm aggressively buying uh, Levi 501 black, white, and gray jeans from size 27 to 44. They need to be true black, though, not over dyed black. Um, red lines and biggie jackets are like crazy. And um, now biggie jeans and first and second edition jackets that are bigger sizes. So, I, okay, like, great. so if you're selling those, listening, if you're selling yeah. those, yeah, run up, run up by me. I, I'm how buying do people, it. How do people find and, you or contact you? junkyard jeans on instagram or like junkyard jeans in the yellow pages back in my day <laughs> but my cell phone number is right on my instagram you can just call me but don't dm me on on instagram because i don't answer that crap so the just phone number is there phone Send them a text right or call them yeah yeah text or call okay amazing eric thanks again man uh this has been a great chat and i appreciate it you betcha. I can't even believe my AirPods lasted this long. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of the show when I tell you how you can support vintage and stuff, okay? Because I know you guys really want to support. I know you guys are listening. You're getting all this wicked value. You're learning about the business. You're getting tips and tricks from the best to ever do it. And you want to support that, don't you? I know you do. Okay, here you go. Well, you can support it by shopping F is in frankvintage.com for 30% off with code VTG and stuff. That's one way. Another way is you can jump on the Vintage and Stuff Patreon, where every week I drop exclusive content just for the members. And it is a growing community on there. And who knows what we'll get up to on there. But you can get on there for just five bucks a month. That's just over one dollar per episode. So are you willing to pay one dollar per episode of Vintage and Stuff? I don't know. You tell me what it's worth to you. But if you want, you can jump on there. Um, I drop exclusive content all the time, every week. New stuff's hitting there. And uh, yeah, so jump on there. Link down below.